Howdy everyone in YouTube land. I haven't done a computer related video in a while so I figured I'm in the process of working on this stuff so I figured why not. I pick up the uh, phone and try to film something here. So what we have in front of me is a Macintosh 2SI power supply. Um, if I'm sure there's other videos out there on this but if anyone knows anything about these early Macintosh machines is that every single one of these needs recapped by now. And this one's no exception, so I figured we might as well just go ahead and do that. I have a parts power supply that was sent to me, I don't know, about eight, nine years ago. And someone had already removed all the capacitors off of it, and I don't know, I didn't know where anything went. I didn't have the capacitor polarities, I didn't have the values, I didn't have anything. So this one went to a 2SI that I parted out a long time ago. Um, I don't know if I still have the motherboard to it or not, but anyways, so I have a reference to look at if I need something or if I have a transformer or something bad, I can pull it off. Anyways, so I pulled this power supply actually worked when I tried it five years ago or so. So I decided to pull it out and start going through my project backlog. And this one is, you can see the, uh, you can see it. it look at the top of this. It's just, it's bad. It's time to go. You can kind of see the um, reflections down in there of just the, the electrolyte laying all over the board. It's starting to corrode various areas. Everything's wet. So, yeah. It's going to have to come apart. I was partially disassembling it. So, we're going to need to remove this board. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a paper sheet such as this one over here that indicates the position of the capacitors and what value they are. Then I'm just going to go ahead and pull all the caps and then we're going to clean this board because I can't do anything until I clean the board. All right, I got the board out. You can hear the fan running in there. This is my little rig for solder fume extraction. I run the 12 volt fan at about eight volts so I can uh, not have it too loud, but I just got the board out and it's the first thing I noticed right away is when I pulled the metal off it's just disgusting uh, I pulled the screw out right here that screw is not supposed to be black and then I flipped over the board and it's just nasty all that's gonna have to come off of there and then I'm gonna have to wash this board uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's bad. That's in rough, rough shape. All right, well, let's, uh, get started. Let's start stinking up the house with dirty, rotten fish and pull these capacitors out so I can wash the board. All righty then, I got all the nasty capacitors out of there. I've got my diagram made up so I know what goes where. So now it's just a matter of washing the board because it's just nasty. And then I got to clean this up too and remove those caps and replace those. Uh, and you can tell where the electrolyte has attacked the board a little bit. So this is going to be fun. So let's go wash the board. All right. I have the uh, power supply board and the cleaner. We're going to go ahead and just do this, which is pretty nasty and I was able to take a toothbrush and clean that off, but it's still fairly nasty. We're going to have to check all the traces because these very dark traces are usually open, but we're going to double check all that. And I got to change these caps anyway, and I got all my parts ready to go. So let's get these caps off and figure out what we're doing. I got the caps off that board. Um, tried to clean it up the best I possibly could. I mean, it's pretty rough. I uh, checked these black traces, and believe it or not, they're connected. And if we want to, we can probably turn the light on here. And, you know, this board's fairly small, so we'll just put that in there anyways. And la, la, let's take a la, 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 la. Let's take a look to make sure we don't see any dead spots in the copper doesn't look like we do so I think we're good to go I think we can just go ahead and put caps on it and we're good with that all right I got the new capacitors installed 
I didn't have a tantalum for over here, so I just used this polymer cap. Uh, it'll work just fine. The one thing I want to make note of real quick as a tech tip is keep in mind with these tantalum capacitors, the line is the exact opposite on a tantalum than, say, an aluminum electrolytic. So the line on this one is negative, but the line on that one is positive, so you need to watch out for that if you use tantalums to substitute that of electrolytics. So I did this part off camera because um, I didn't think about to uh, pick up recording on this until after the fact, but uh, the new bus card has had, I've already replaced the capacitor on there. There's only had the one that I needed to worry about. And I was getting ready to pull the motherboard and I realized I had already recapped the motherboard. You can see the capacitors that are put in there and um, I don't remember when I did the motherboard. It, it could have been years ago, but uh, yeah, so the power supply was the one thing I didn't do yet, but you can tell I went ahead and changed the caps already. So all the caps are done on this board. So in theory, this board should work and I was already smart enough to pull the battery. Um, but one thing I did notice though is there's been a creature living in here. So I need to get the drives and everything. I got to get this thing, take it back apart so I can take this case and clean it. And I think the best way to clean the case is to just put it in the dishwasher. So I've got it set up and ready to go. So I'm going to go ahead and pull all this out and get this case washed up so we don't have mouse piss all over the place. So I got the case cleaned. I went ahead and cleaned the rubber feet a little bit, still a little bit wet. Um, the problem is though, it's nice and squeaky clean, but it took off all of the uh, RF paint. So maybe that wasn't such the, of the greatest idea, but you know, at least it's clean now. All the mouse piss and feces and shit is out of it. So there's always that. But yeah, I got the, the feet clean as best as I possibly could. It's a little bit wet, but I think, I think we'll be all right with that. Uh, next thing to do is I'm waiting for the power supply to dry so I can finish up recapping the power supply and then uh, we can start putting this together and test it for power on, make sure it works. And then we got to move on some, to some other things. All right, this power supply is all nice and dry. It's all cleaned up. One thing I've noticed right away though is the uh, bleaching that the cap juice has done to the PC board. And, you know, I tried to scratch it. It doesn't come off. So, at this point, it's time to get the capacitors installed, get this module put back in here, and we should be able to fire this thing up and do a quick test before we move on. Alrighty then. We got the new capacitors installed. I have the driver module, switching controller module reinstalled on the bottom or on the main board. Uh... I mean, there's a little bit of, hold on, I don't need this on anymore. There's a little bit of copper corrosion around here, but there's not a whole lot I can do about that. However, the capacitors are now installed. It is time to, oh, I forgot. This thing filled with water, so I had to take this apart and dry this out manually because I forgot to remove it from the board when I did the wash cycle. So all the new parts are in there. I double checked it all checked it against my little diagram right here so at this point it's time to put it together and then we're going to get it in the case with the motherboard and we're going to do a first power up and see what happens at this point all righty well power supply is done it's right here it's time to get this thing put back together and hope like hell that it actually works well that's in there all right, time to get the fan put in somehow. Yeah, I'm not sure how this is done. Oh, there it goes. All right, fan's in there. All that's in there. It's time to get the power supply put in. Get that done. Somehow, let's see. 
So that. All right, it's in there. Now, let's see if it works. Power. Hey, 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 I like that sound. All right, we're good. It's fixed. Now that we know the machine works, we got the power supply working. It actually worked first shot. I didn't try. I didn't try this before the camera turned on or anything. I literally put this thing together, as you saw, and tested it first time. Came right on. The motherboard I recapped. I'm assuming a few years ago. I don't remember. Obviously, I forgot about it because I didn't think I had recapped it already. Um, so it's not part of the video. Sorry about that. But anyways, moving along. Now we got to focus our attention on the next two things in this uh, restoration project. This the maintenance has to be done on this, and there's been thousands of videos out there on that. But I'll you know I'll do it anyways. Um, and the next thing to that is the hard drive. So normal people, or should I say sane people, would just put that aside and do like a SCSI to SD or blue SCSI or some other type of you know solid state solution. And there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing at all, you know, but insane people like the guy behind the camera here will take this drive apart and attempt to repair this drive. And then once it's repaired, it will be used as the daily driver for this machine. Now, it won't be daily because, you know, nobody really uses these things daily anymore. Anyway, it's more of a I'm bored. Let's go turn it on, play a couple of games and then turn it off for the next week or so or whatever. You know, that's really what it's for. So I think we're just going to take this drive apart, do some inspections on the, the rubber because the rubber is known to go bad in these. I did a video, oh, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, somewhere in there where I took one of these drives apart and was able to kickstart it to get it going. And since found out where the magnet resides, there's a rubber bumper that goes bad and the, the actuator will stick to that and it won't release. The other, the other thing too is some of these drives, I don't remember which ones, but some of them have the rubber bumper underneath the platter, which makes it really fun to try to repair. And I've done a single drive platter. I didn't make a video of it, but I did do a single drive platter where I moved the head stack out of the way, protected the heads, got them out of there, and I was able to take the single platter and remove it and then protect all that stuff in a, in a static bag that ziplocked so we didn't get dust damage or anything like that. And then I was able to get down to that rubber bumper and redo it, clean it all off. I took a, I took a cassette tape pinch roller, hollowed it out a little bit, and then shoved it on there and that was the new bumper and then i had to i had to shave it because it was too wide in diameter but at least it was a rubber roller and you can use any rubber roller as long as it's close enough to where you could take the dremel over there and you know clear it off a little anyway so replace the bumper in there put the drive back together and it worked fine it's in my color classic that's in storage so it all works fine at least when i put it away it worked fine i don't know about now but it did then so um, I don't know if I'm going to get in that level of detail with the, with this drive, but I will take it apart and we will do an inspection on what that looks like and the quality of it and all that because I know that these all fail and it, it depends on you know how they were stored too. So without further ado, we're just going to go ahead and um, get this drive apart and start inspecting it and see what we got to do next. Now that we got the drive apart, just four screws, two here, two here. Um, I don't have the tripod handy, so it's not like I can do this while it's recording. But uh, this is the cover that goes over it. You just slide it off, and as you can tell, it's starting to yellow already. Um, key points to note here is what we have to do is we have to relubricate these critical points that are in here. And this, this right here swings out that actually releases the mechanism and allows it to drop down. So first order of business is we have to remove this head this head support bracket and that will allow us to lower the head so I have to stop the head from falling and then just carefully lower it because you don't want it to go smashing down so there that's out of the way uh, the second thing we got to do is we got to remove the springs here 
there's two springs there's one on that side and there's one on that side and we should be able playing with this lever be able to remove the entire top plate or this top mechanism so we can get underneath it because we need to get to it to clean it but not only that we have there's there's four points underneath there that we have to lubricate as well I've, there's many different videos out there, especially in the pop culture YouTube channels on tech stuff, retro tech stuff. There's many videos where the people have already gone in to uh, restore these drives. I'm not going to go to the same detail because, well, you can watch it everywhere. But just know that that's the general rule of thumb. Also, there's people use many different lubricants. I use this Zoom Spout oil over here, which will stay pliable for a long time longer than I'll probably have the machine um, and that's all I want to do the next thing I got to do is I have to remove the eject motor because the eject motor um, also needs servicing which I can actually do that right now fairly easily so there's one screw there and there's one screw back there you got to be careful these screws can strip out real easy and then that's it the motor comes out simple as that and then what we have to do here is we have to re-lubricate everything here. First thing I got to do though is I have to inspect the, there's a gear in here that constantly gets chewed up and broken. I'm going to be honest with you, I've only ever seen it once. I've serviced many of these drives and I haven't seen them broken yet. And after I had cleaned this out and re-lubricated everything, I didn't see it break again. The problem is the gears do get brittle over time, but more importantly, this this mechanism this carriage is what gets it what's it or what this gear pulls on to eject it and if this gets gummed up like they occasionally do there's too much resistance on this then the motor will just torque down on the gear and just shred the shit out of it and that's what happens to it so luckily there are 3d printed replacements i got some of the early prototypes when the guy first designed the replacements but i haven't really tried them yet so i don't know how good they are or anything like that i'm sure they've improved a lot since then so i might have to pick some more up but without further ado let's just get this carriage assembly off and uh see where we got to go with that so my second tip of the day don't do what i did and when you remove these washers one goes flying across the room and gets lost forever so now i'm going to be short one and i don't have any more of those so yeah I don't know how well this drive is going to work after I get done with it, but we'll see. We'll just have to we'll have to deal with it the way it is. But for now, I had to clean this up. I had to clean all the old spooge off of it uh, in these key points here, and uh, relubricate pretty much at this point. So we'll lubricate all that. We're going to lubricate some stuff over here, and then after that, what we're going to do is we're going to carefully. Lift these heads up and clean them with alcohol and a Q-tip just to make sure everything's kosher. Next thing I like to do after you have this thing apart and you're cleaning up all the old grease is I like to inspect the switches because if any of these are broken or not working properly, for one, it's not gonna sense the disc that's in there. It's also not gonna sense the right protect, but it's also not gonna be able to tell if it's a double density or high density disc. And these are the switches that tell it how to do that. So it probably wouldn't be a bad thought to get some deoxit or some contact cleaner into these switches a little bit and kind of work them in. Uh, the other thing you want to do too is we need to inspect these electrolytic capacitors and make sure that they are not leaking. You could just change them, but you have to be careful which series you order because these are these very low profile electrolytic capacitors. You could probably just replace them with tantalums because I guarantee they make tantalums now that will fit in their place, which kind of look like that. And then you don't have to worry about that. But if you do order replacement electrolytics for these, you must make sure you get the right height or you're going to obviously run into problems. Same thing goes over here. Um, the next thing I do after I clean the head is I got to make sure the home position optical sensor is clear. There's no dust in that. But also more importantly, we need to lubricate this worm gear. This worm gear is what allows the head to slide back and forth and seek the tracks. And then I try to get some oil down into this bearing assembly too that goes into this motor. You cannot move this motor. Let me restate again. Do not move this motor in any direction or remove it. Because if you do so, you will lose the track alignment. You ever run into a floppy drive to where it won't read any disks that you make for it, but yet 
if you reformat the disk on that particular drive, that drive will read and write it just fine. But if you go to take the disk to another computer or another drive, it won't read it. That's because the track alignment is out of whack. A good heavy drop on these drives will knock the head alignment out. And the only way to fix that is to rotate, loosen and rotate this motor, which will move the head on this worm insert just ever so slightly. Because when this motor when this motor is actuated, it's a stepper motor, so it can only step so many degrees per step. So this head is going to move in the exact same spot every time it steps. So if you need something in between, you have to physically rotate the motor, and that is your track alignment. And the only way to do that is to have a properly formatted disc and an oscilloscope on the test point. Once you have the test point, you can then look at the waveform on the scope as this thing is reading the disc and then adjust this motor for peak amplitude. Otherwise, you're, you, you screw the whole thing up. And I don't know where the test point is on this drive. I forget. Um, then there's also the head amp adjustment here, which you do not want to adjust. You don't want to touch that. Um, anyway, so yeah, just t this, the third tip of the day, do not touch this motor unless absolutely necessary. And if you do, you'll have to realign the track alignment on the drive. Just FYI. Now that we got everything cleared out, lubricated, reassembled, um, had, everything seems to be all right. We just cleaned the heads with the alcohol. Uh, the next thing we have to do is we're going to have to um, get some lubrication in there, like I said, without moving the motor. And then what we're going to do is start taking a look in here and see what we have to do in here. All right, we got the uh, top cover off, and the easiest way to do that is take a pick tool or something along those lines and carefully get under here, release that tab, pull it out so you don't break it, um, and then the lid will pop off. So then what will happen is it, it will, you know, it'll release that tab, and then you'll just lift it this way and out of the way. Next thing we got to do is do a, a good inspection inside, and let's remove this nylon gear right here, move it out of the way. Uh, we can see some pretty crusty grease in here, but I don't see anything damaging. And this is the gear that cracks. Notice it's a different color. In the olden days, when I used to work on this stuff, that was not yellow. That was actually the same color as this. So this is made out of a different material. Um, and I don't know... I guess they get brittle over the years. I don't see any cracks, but it does need some lubrication. So I'm not going to replace that yet unless it breaks. But what I will do is grab the alcohol, some Q-tips, clean that up. And then we're going to add a little bit of the spout oil in there too. Get it in the motor. Make sure it's all good. The second thing we have to do with these is we have to um, inspect the reeds or the actual, I don't know, it's not a reed switch. But there's, there's a switch in here with two contact points. And if that get, gets dirty, this thing will just continuously run like ree, ree, or just keep going when you try to eject it. Or when you go to do an eject, it'll go halfway and then stop because there's an issue with those contacts. So we got to clean those. we got to do all that, you know. The other thing I forgot to mention is when you're doing the lubrication, you want to lubricate these roller bearings too. So that way they guide properly on the rails when you're doing an eject and inject. So once again, we're going to go for broke and see if this thing works. I have the uh, drive all put back together now. Um, we're just going to go ahead and, well that was easy, drop that guy in, plug in our little connector down here in the board. Alright, connector's in. We're going to plug in the power, hit the soft button in the back turn it on all right I don't have a boot disc yet I gotta make some uh, I probably do but who knows where they are I haven't touched them in years so I just grabbed a blank disc and then we're gonna see what the hell happens I heard it grab but is it going to eject Yep, it rejected it.
That's good news. And the jet gear is not broke, at least not yet. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Next thing we got to look at is uh, I'm going to pop the top off this hard drive and we're going to do an inspection and see what's going on. Um, there's been some debate and I'll probably get some flaming for this and I really don't give a shit. Um, taking these hard drives apart in a non-dust free environment. It's debatable. Modern drives, yes. Modern drives, high density drives, you're going to have a lot of problems, okay? But, with that said, these older drives are not perfectly sealed. Their air does leak by, and there's a filter inside here to catch that, okay? So, taking this apart, making sure not to spit on it and everything else, throw, drop my hair, dead skin flakes, and all that stuff on it, sure. But as long as I keep it relatively clean, and I put the uh, lid back on it, these older drives, it's going to work fine. Now, one thing I've noticed is that's a pretty big hard drive for a machine like this. So, it's actually kind of amazing. I just unplugged the machine. Uh, so, I bet this drive might not be so bad, but I'll take the cover off and we'll double check it. So, right away on quick inspection, I just took it out of the bracket. We have two capacitors right there. They look like tantalums or something, but they are not. If you look closely, they're actually plastic cased aluminum electrolytics so they don't look like they're leaking yet but they have to go so if you have any of these old drives always do a big picture physical examination of everything because if you run into something like that 10 years down the line you're probably going to have problems so let's go ahead and we're going to take care of that now but before we do like i said we are going to go ahead and we're going to crack. These are probably JIS screws, and I don't have a JIS screwdriver. So, yeah. Ah, crack. As you can tell, this thing has not been apart before. It's not since the factory back in the 90s. Doing this one-handedly while holding the camera on the other hand is quite a fun task. Because, oops. Yeah, if it didn't work before, it definitely doesn't now. Yeah, it's fine. I don't care much about this drive anyways. I just wanted to make sure that if I can get some use out of it without putting in any of these crazy solid-state storage mediums installed, maybe we'll get somewhere with it. It's a 500 meg drive, which I don't see a whole lot with the Apple brand for SCSI anyway so this machine must have come with a top of the line drive back in the day or someone or someone put it in I mean there's always that so without further ado let's crack this together all right nothing too out of the ordinary does this drive have a filter network in it? Ooh, yeah, she's a uh, she's got some use on her. Yeah, see, there's the filter I was talking about. All right, so this is a double platter drive. So if there's rubber under there, I'm screwed. You got to have a special tool to remove anything more than one platter. Um, otherwise, because here's the thing, the way these drives work is at the factory when they're manufactured, the platters are put on a machine and the servo tracks are written on the disc at the factory during their low level formatting. It's not done in this drive because it can't be done in this drive because the voice coil has no reference to where that head is until the servo tracks are written, right? So the other problem is too, is if you, if these two platters move around from each other any bit at all you're going to get into a cylinder misalignment condition which will pretty much destroy the drive uh, because now the servo tracks aren't going to line up so in order to remove these platters you've got to have a special tool to extract the platters away from the drive um, and basically you have to keep it together so like for example if you remove the platters there's a sleeve I mean there's different ways there's different tools but 
I'm thinking like a piston ring compressor if you work on engines. Once you get the head stack out of the way, there's a sleeve that just clamps on these things hard. You remove the screws and then the whole thing comes out. You can set it off the side so you can work on the drive. Or if the spindle motor is bad and you're doing data recovery, you can move the platters off. Grab another identical drive, put the platters back into place, and then do some data recovery or something like that. And a drive like this, I don't care about the data. I don't care how long the drive lasts. I just don't care. So we're just inspecting the rubber, and we're going to make sure that it's not pliable or sticky, yet, or still pliable, but not sticky yet. Make sure everything's good. If everything looks good, I'm just going to put this drive back together and just let it ride. I mean, there's no point in even... Because you could do do if you're not careful, you can damage the drive worse than what it was before. So, but if the rubber, because the the newer drives I've noticed are the different types of drives, the rubber stop for the home position is under the platter. So if it's under this one, it's game over. I don't have the tool to remove the platters. So um, yeah, we'll have to see how that works. And a data recovery hard drive repair tools are stupid expensive too. So. There's also that. I'd have to justify the cost of buying that stuff. You know, are these drives worth repairing for a living to justify the cost of that? Nah, not when you have things like that over there. So, I mean, it really depends on the preference. Some people are purists and they got to have the physical drive in there with a the sound. And I have no problems with that. I like that too, to be honest. But at the same time, I also have to be realistic. These drives aren't going to last forever. And people know that already, so... Anyways, I'm rambling. I'm going to pause the video here and start doing some inspections with my flashlight and see what we got going on. Okay, so I did some checking. It turns out the rubber is just under this screw where this release catch is. This catch is designed, in case anybody's not aware, when the platters get up to speed. Until the platters get up to speed, this actuator arm cannot move because this plastic interlock keeps it in place. So when this disc is spinning at the correct RPM, it'll create an air bearing. The air bearing moves this lever out of the way, which will release the heads. But if you look closely, the rubber is right there. So I tested it with my pick tool and all that. It's still hard and it's still pliable. And it's not in the process of degrading yet. So you know what? I'm gonna leave it alone. I'm just gonna put the lid back on this drive carefully. And we are going to put this drive back together. Was it necessary? I mean, it's 500 meg drive. It's a newer drive. Was it necessary to open this drive? Probably not. But I know with the older ones, like the 160 megs and the 80 megs, the 40 meg drives, you have to. It's pretty much a guarantee that it's bad. But this is a much newer 500 megabyte SCSI drive. So, yeah, I, I just wanted to double check with my own intuition whether the drive was still good or not. And it appears to be. So... We're just going to put this back together and we are just going to put it in the system and then we're going to let it spin up see if you can, we can hear it start booting. So now that we've inspected the platter and, and the, the, all that stuff, everything appears to be good. It's time to replace these capacitors. So, um, yeah. I'm going to use electrolytics here because that's what I have on hand. I bought a bag of like 200 of these things of different values assorted back when I was still living in Ohio at Dayton Audio or Parts Express. They were having a huge sale on those, so I said, okay, well, I'm when I do simple recaps and stuff like that, I, I just bought bags of them, and they're starting to get a bit of age on them. They're about 10 years old at this point, but um, they're still good. They've never been used, and for something like this, I don't care, so we're going to go ahead. If it was a customer's drive, I would probably use solid-state caps here, but in this case, we'll just do it this way. It's my own personal stuff, so it is what it is. All right, so I had to scratch the idea of using the electrolytics I had because the cases were too big to fit in between here. And even when I did lay them down, they stuck out the bottom, which would not would prevent me to put this back on. So I had to go into my uh, stash and grab my solid caps so I can do that instead. I don't like using these except in very niche cases, but it is what it is. I, there's nothing I can do about it. And when I heated these up to remove them, I smelled the fish oil, so they were on their way out. All right, I got the new capacitors in there. I gotta clean it up a little bit, but they're in there. Old ones are out, and they're gonna go in the trash can. And time to put it back together and get it in the machine and see what the hell happens. 
All right, so I got the drive done and um, ready to go. My my lunch drink is just getting water all over the place. Anyways, let's get it installed here. I gotta remember how this goes in here. And of course, as I'm doing a video, Discord is going crazy in the background. And yeah, anyways. All right, so let's see what happens here. something to do that there it goes it's booting something so I think this machine is basically restored at this point we still got to test the floppy drive for proper functionality but in order to do that I'm gonna to have to get a monitor and all that stuff out and the issue that I have is I don't have a good LCD that works with this thing and I'm not gonna go and get a retro tank or any of that crazy stuff that's just not my style so I need to find a monitor that's compatible with these signals that doesn't take up the whole desk because my Trinitrons, Macintosh Trinitrons, take up the whole desk. Um, but I might have something. I'll have to look and see, but I gotta dig it out. It's still new in the box, too. And there's my solution. I knew after having these things for, I don't know, 10 years, 12 years, I was gonna use them someday. <laughs> problem is that someday never came until now so let's do a box opening shall we man there's all kinds of footage in this diverse video let's see that's oh man brand spanking new well sort of this came from a school so there's some markers and stuff like that it needs cleaned um i don't want to do that in this video because it's got to be clean with baking soda and retro you know you know how it is the whole nine yards not something i wish to do right now meanwhile well that didn't work out the way i wanted it to hmm. well i need both hands so one second while i set the camera down pull this out maybe this is uh man I need four hands actually there we go now it's out all right okay oh hang on there styrofoam back in the box it's got a nice little manual but I don't need that who reads the manual now we are going to kill my ears with ear weight there we go there it's out man that thing looks it must be an off white because it looks beige well not even beige, it looks, when was this made? I don't even know. It's old enough to wear, yes. <laughs> All right, well, I'm hoping this is compatible with the frequencies that this machine uses, but I guess we'll find out. All right, mm, bag. Get that out of my way. That's in pretty good shape. Well, it should be, it's brand new. Well, brand new old stock, I should say. Because who knows when this thing was made. Oh, man, I'm so afraid to do it. Should I do it? Yeah, I guess I should. Ah, oh, that felt good. Interesting. Never seen that design before. Okay. Who's the bastard that did that? Because, uh, I can't get that out. Let's try this one. 
All right, yep, I need both hands. Let me get all this cleared out. All right, I got everything unboxed. Isn't it just cute? I think it is. All right, here we go. Let's pop its cherry. Maybe, ah, oh, there we go, nice. Okay, so let's get all this crap connected. I think I need to put this stuck on my chair. Let's put that back there. Of course, it'd help if I plug it in the right way. All right, let's see. This is cool because this power supply has an output for that kind of plug. And then plug that in. Then we got our power. nothing oh wait I wonder yep that's cool all right does it work oh well, that's a shame dang well it looks like I need my uh, let's see do I have another VGA adapter hang on well, I have this one, so let's see if it works. I hope so. Because if not, well, then you saw an unboxing for nothing. Dang it. Well, that didn't work. Hmm. Trying to find something that works with these old machines is really hard these days. Well, then, I guess that's not going to work. Well, that sucked. But at least you got to see an unboxing. So, there's that. And this is not ideal because it takes up so much space. But it is what it is, I suppose. Alright, let's power this thing on and see what we get. That was an interesting artifact. Oh, that's better. All right. Well, I didn't get a I didn't get a keyboard or anything because all I want to do is I want to test the functionality of the floppy. But it looks like we're booting at least. Yeah, this is the unicorn mouse in a box that has that does both ADB and USB, and it's fully optical. I found this one, but I've never never been able to find another one. I'd like to have a couple more, but this is the only one I got for now. So, to analyze what happened, I'm not entirely certain. I'm wondering if the um, other monitors, because I, I tried this with an LCD and I kept getting like out of range and other weird stuff too. So, I'm wondering if it's because the 640 by 480 resolution that this thing puts out is at a weird refresh rate or something. And if, you know, it's 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 been years since I've worked on this stuff and it's starting to come back to me. I'm wondering, if I remember correctly, I think, these run at 67 hertz and not 60 hertz and that might be what it is but that monitor supposedly can go up to 800 by 600 that little monochrome one that i just showed so in theory it should have been able to sync with it but maybe not uh anyways let's see what we have here i don't know i didn't this is the drive that came with the machine so i don't know what's installed on it or any of that looks like it's got some menuing things and other tidbits and chinguses on there. I don't know. We'll see. That looks like an energy thing. It's all black and white though. Um, this CRT is getting a bit tired. Um, it's I've got another one that was damaged in shipping that I could probably pull the tube out of and put it in here. Because this one works alright, but the CRT is getting a bit tired. You can tell when you go to turn it up because it just gets really blurry. So for the sake of the camera, let's turn it down. And then we're gonna, yeah, man, that, that, that optical mouse is fast. All right, so looks like we got Microsoft Word. We'll close that out. All I really want to do is just check and see what the, what's it launching. Why is it launching? So I hate when people put things in the startup just just because they can. All right, so what are we running here? Nine megabytes of memory, 102 megs of memory on the hard drive. Wow, okay. So someone set the virtual memory up really high. Well, it looks like it was used for the internet. 
Not entirely certain, but the good news is, is it does work. Let's see. I need to, I need to fix this because this is driving me nuts. Monitors. I'm hoping we can go to 256 colors. Ah, that's better. All right. Now, what I really wanted to do was to check the drive and see if it even does anything. It looks like it recognizes the default format. Well, let's see if there's anything we can copy on to that disk. Microsoft Office Setup. Well, let's copy that, shall we? It'll take up approximately a little over half the disk. More or less than half the disk, I mean. And then let's hopefully you can read it. Verifying. I'm assuming it's re reading it to make sure that there's no bad sectors during the copy. So then what we're going to do after that is we are going to copy it back off of the disk and make sure it does it properly, then we'll delete it. Oh, no, bad disk. Yeah, and you know, that doesn't surprise me considering um, these discs are new old stock and they're probably from the 80s, so, or early 90s. Let's see if we can erase it. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if this version of Mac OS updates the um, bad sector table on floppy disks. It might just say initialization failed and spit it out. Usually you'll get that either because it can't update the, the sector tables or if track zero is bad. If track zero is bad, which is where all your disk information goes, you can't remap that. So it just ejects a disk saying initialization failed. But it seems like the drive is working, but my disk is crap. Although I'm not surprised. These disks are from 91, 92, I don't remember. Verifying format. Oh, found a bad sector. This is what it typically does is if it finds bad sectors. And this is going to be a while, so I'm going to go ahead and pause this for now. So we get to this point, and, it, and you can tell it's a pretty bad disc. Cause you can... Yeah, so she's, uh, needs some help. Seems like it started right about midway, and it, it's like it can't read half the disc. I wonder if it's dropped ahead. I doubt it though. It's just a crap disc. I'll probably go grab another one and double verify. There's a funny glitch. Haven't seen that before. Seems to have picked up again without stalling, so quite a few bad sectors. It's definitely the disc that's bad. Alright, well. We should have a, um, yeah, 217K is a bad sector, so that disc is completely unreliable. You would never use it for anything. Sure, it would work, but you would never use it for anything. So, uh, yeah, that's a 3M high-density Macintosh formatted disc that is brand new out of the box. It wasn't shrink-wrapped. I think I opened it years ago. That uh, is no good, but that that's becoming a common thing these days. Which is why things like the floppy MU exists, thank God. Um, anyway, so, looks like the drive works. And I think we can um, go ahead and conclude this video. Because I don't want to really go a whole lot more further than this point. So, it seems like 
Adobe page mill. Let's see. It seems like we've got everything's functional. Let's see. I do want to see something curious. I'm, I am curious though. Get info. When was this volume created? Ah, 2000. So not that long ago. Well, I say not that long ago because it's been 21 years. But to me, it doesn't seem that long ago. Even though I was only 14 at the time. Maybe 13. Actually, yeah, 13. Anyway, so that's it for this video. I'm going to go ahead and uh, end it right here. Um, and that should be it. So thank you for watching. And feel free to leave a comment if you have one.